Hello, friends, and welcome to Impact Everywhere, the podcast that looks for people having a positive impact in unexpected places. Today, we have a NASA scientist by the name of Michelle Thaler. Michelle and I never actually met prior to this podcast. I had just seen her giving a talk online and thought it was so fascinating that I had to reach out. I was particularly curious about asking her for her opinion about the intersection between the sciences and the arts because they're often perceived as opposites and the role that they play together in making the world a better place. In today's episode, we explore the unexpected similarities between art and science, why exploring the boundaries of sciences is important and more impactful than we know, as well as the growing hostility towards the sciences and why that may be happening. Of course, I couldn't resist but talk about climate change and ask her for some advice on what we should be doing about it. The questions of whether or not we should be measuring the impact of the arts, which is a personal passion of mine. And then we touch briefly but recurrently on the spiritual importance of sciences and arts to keep us balanced, inspired, and motivated. I think the most exciting thing about this week's podcast is probably the interesting NASA facts that are sprinkled throughout the entire presentation. I think you guys are going to enjoy this one. This is Michelle Thaler, and here she is diving straight into the stereotypes that we have of scientists and why they're completely wrong. I think that there are some really interesting ways that the practice of science has changed. And they run from things that use technology to things that are very personal, very culture based. The stereotype of the scientist as being kind of the lone white man in a laboratory, brilliant guy pulling ideas out of his head all by himself, that was never really true. I mean, one of the things that I actually is, is a huge annoyance to me in my life is the myth of Albert Einstein. By the way, I love Albert Einstein. I mean, he was very human. He certainly had some parts of him that were not perfect, but he is a brilliant, brilliant scientist. But the idea that he simply worked by himself as an outsider and pulled this stuff out of his head. No, he was very much a part of the scientific establishment. He was very much a collaborator. Famously, he really couldn't develop the mathematics needed to to sort of express his ideas in physics. So he had people collaborating with him, including his first wife, all the way along. So the idea that it's something you do alone is a stereotype that never really existed. And the idea that we're that different and that isolated and that odd a stereotype, again, that I think really doesn't exist very much. We all do have too many science fiction costumes. That's true. But science has been, to me, a lot more about intuition, a lot more about emotional resonance, about whether a topic seems right or a solution seems elegant. It's an emotional response. It's not really a logical one. These days, it involves the ability to work in groups and to work with diverse groups, people that think very differently than you do. And if you can't do that, if you can't assemble a large, diverse group of people to work with to support your research, you'll just end up isolated and your work will die. Um, So it also increasingly has been a world where in order to be a successful scientist, your main number one skill, people talk about, you know, is it mathematics? Is it physics? Is is it computer science? What's the one skill you need? It's fundraising and grant proposal writing. That's the number one thing that they'll be judged on. So the practice of science has evolved a lot. And the perception of science is something that is, it's one of the things I'm really struggling with right now. You know, the idea that somehow we are the other, that we are a threat to culture, that we would ever say anything knowingly false, that we would mislead people. I heard somebody say, you know, climate change, well, all you guys want is more funding, more money. It's like, yeah, that's true, but you don't take that home. That goes to your university. It is true that it's good professionally to win those funds, but you do not get rich doing that. This idea of the hostility to science is something I'm really kind of trying to parse. And unfortunately, I doubt it's entirely an accident. I think it was yet another way to divide people. I think dividing people has become very politically lucrative, or at least it's perceived to be that. Oh, wow. There's a lot to unpack there. I guess when we imagine scientists in our minds and we think towards Hollywood movies, we see these like big corporate laboratories or these government funded agencies that are just throwing infinite amounts of resources towards the sciences so that they can research something very targeted. But the reality of that is very, very different. When it comes to hostility against the sciences, though, do you think that people are frustrated because they think that scientists are not working on the world's most pressing problems that are right here in front of us and looking too far, too distant, such as trying to get people to land someone on Mars when right here on Earth there are so many problems? 
Why is it so important for us to discover more about the universe and spend so much money on that? Okay, I love this. So as you can probably guess, I get this question a lot. And I have versions of this that I give to congressional staffers, and I have versions of this that I give to kindergartners. So I'm actually curious about what your answer is. What do you think the answer to that is? Um, oh, gosh, I was expected to be put on the spot here. Let's see. I think there are probably two reasons why researching like sciences are important. The first is looking for sort of parallel discoveries across disciplines. So when I think of biomimicry as an example, I think the Shinkansen bullet train design in order to make it as aerodynamic as possible was accomplished by studying the beak of a kingfisher. So by diving deeper into different fields, you can occasionally sort of take experiences from one field and move them into another. And I think the second is probably the process of discovery being really important because by simply trying to search for answers, that's when you can have the unintended consequences of a new discovery. So yeah, I guess those might be my two reasons. Those are obviously two of the best and strongest reasons. You're talking about things like spinoffs. The reason you have a personal computer, the reason I have a laptop sitting in front of me is because the Apollo program had the need to miniaturize computers to send them into space. And that was the beginning of the computer revolution, where people had less expensive, smaller computers. And whether it is, in fact, your smartphone and the satellite systems that help those, all of those are spinoffs. Of course, medical spinoffs as well. So many things from CAT scans and MRIs to the computers that run them to, I mean, all of the technology, it, like you said, I mean, you're trying to solve some problem that's very difficult to solve. And yes, this technology spills out of it. I want to talk about two more things. The other one you talk about is the unintended consequences of a discovery. And this is where I think that people don't quite understand blue sky research, meaning you don't even know what you're going to find. You just are doing research to try to understand something. And uh, it was back in the late 70s and early 1980s that we started launching our first satellite specifically to study in detail the chemical content of the Earth's atmosphere. And Earth scientists were just honestly interested in this. They were like, hey, what gases make up our atmosphere? How do they change over time? And they actually started to discover something that for several years they actually thought was an error. They thought that this must be an error in our data because specifically the ozone layer was getting depleted. It was falling away way too fast. And they actually did think that that was an error with the satellite measurement. This was a NASA satellite. There was also work done on ground by universities. But in just simply trying to analyze the contents of our atmosphere, we realized we were destroying our ozone layer. And if we had done nothing, if we hadn't found that out, by the year 2060, we estimate we would have almost no ozone layer, that would have meant the end of civilization. I mean that. There would have been no agriculture, not going outside, no people outside, no cattle outside. There would have been impacts to the sea life and the ocean plankton. I mean, 2060 is 40 years away, right? So the idea that anybody is going to have grandchildren is a NASA spinoff. So when you talk about doing science, and the same is true now for the climate science going on, it almost seemed kind of unrecognizable. In the New York Times, this wonderful big article about a month ago, that according to our, our best projections, not our worst case scenarios, but our best middle of the line projections, we're looking at more than a meter sea rise by the end of the century. That will probably displace a good fraction of a billion people. This is the type of stuff you need to see coming. And this is what scientists are frustrated that people don't seem to engage with. It's like, you can move a billion people, but it's going to take some time. It's not going to happen in just a couple of years. And so we need to start doing this now. So that's technological spinoffs. That's knowing your environment. Let me ask you, would you really not care if you'd ever seen Jupiter? Jupiter doesn't matter, right? I mean, none of the things we've talked about. The planets out there, the fact that we live in a galaxy that is 100,000 light years across, one light year is 6 trillion miles, there's no use to that, really? I think there is. And when somebody really says to me, they just have no interest at all. My mom is one, by the way, I'll admit this. So she, she's a very human-oriented person. She was involved in civil rights in the 1960s, very socially active. And she will tell you, she just couldn't care less about Jupiter. I understand that there's a diversity of opinion out there, but I think there will always be a good number of people that still want art and literature and philosophy and the depth of being human and scientific curiosity, just for curiosity's sake. What is a black hole? How does it work? What's the nearest one? You know, how big is our galaxy? 
the beauty and the richness and the resiliency it's given me in life. You know, when life gets hard, this curiosity, this beauty sustains me. I wouldn't want to live without it. Those two extra answers that you just gave there are really thought provoking. I mean, I remember growing up as a kid hearing about this ozone layer depletion thing, and it just never crossed my mind to think about how or why it was discovered. And so having this backstory, just to remind me that the reason I have a future is because of someone's curiosity is kind of mind boggling. And the intangible half of that, which is the importance of wonder and beauty and delight and curiosity, which you just mentioned, is something that I think we tend not to notice when it's there. So how does this actually manifest itself in your day-to-day professional life? Because you are an outreach manager. So every time you communicate with people, how do you fuse a combination of science and measurements and all these technical kind of things that NASA is known for, as well as the the magic of art and emotion and beauty and wonder? That's one thing that I'm really missing right now is the person-to-person stuff. I've spent a lot of time with my personal presentations. By the way, that's not what I do really for my work. My work is at least 80%, maybe more, of budgets and meetings and uh, strategic plans. I am not a person that NASA just sends out and says, here, go talk to people. I'm an administrator. (laughs) But I am not kidding. When I'm speaking, and I, I know that I'm doing it right, my audience and I laugh and cry together. I'm not exaggerating. If I'm doing it right personally, I want them to be able to come up to me and feel my vulnerability. I literally do try to give them a chunk of my soul. I talk about what these things emotionally mean to me. I get very drained. There was this video of the Mars Pathfinder rover landing. And I swear the first 30 times I showed that, I teared up every single time. Because this was a terribly difficult thing to do, and you can't rehearse it. Mars has different gravity. It has a different atmosphere than the Earth. This isn't something we could rehearse. You had to put it all together, test bit by bit by bit, but you couldn't test the whole thing. You couldn't just practice landing. It wouldn't work in Earth's atmosphere. And so that was a moment where decades of joy, decades of work became this moment of joy. In the video were my friends. I remember that night. I remember when they announced that it was safely down and they were getting a signal and people started screaming and jumping up and down. I lost it. I actually realized several minutes later that I had been screaming and jumping up and down, but I don't remember how it started. I lost myself in emotion. If you've never had that feeling, I really hope you do. We were so excited. We started to try to high five each other. Our adrenaline was up so much that we kept missing. There's several videos you can find the NASA high five. And the thing that I love about NASA is they solved the problem. They brought in a specialist to teach us how to high five. And and no, I'm sure they didn't pay for this, but they actually, in our training, taught us the right way to high five. And you never miss. Um, What you do is when you're high fiving somebody, you don't look at their face or their hand. You look at their elbow. And that gives you, for some reason, try it next time. It, look at their elbow, the, the hand that you're high-fiving at. Look at their elbow. And, and it gives you the right angle. And so I have practiced high-fives so that we never look so stupid again. You know, so. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the beauty of doing these podcasts is learning these random facts that you would just never hear from anywhere else. And I absolutely love it. Thanks for sharing. I really just love how you wear your heart on your sleeve and the passion for what you do just totally shines through. And I think that conveying if emotion is so important because when we think of how humans make decisions, they make it based on feelings. And this ability to close the gap between the heart and the mind is your superpower, but also the superpower of all the different artists, storytellers, communicators, and creatives that are out there. With so much of the world facing big existential challenges right now, what kind of responsibility do you think everyone should have? And how do they go about to accumulate that same passion and emotion to convey messages that they believe in. So this is something that I believe really gets at the heart of some diversity issues in science. And in this case, from fairly privileged people like me. But growing up, I knew I was interested in science from a very early age. My mom says as soon as I could walk, I would try to be going outside to look at the stars. And I couldn't tell her why. I loved it. I loved everything to do with space. But because I was a young woman and because I love arts, I loved music. I excelled at choir and for a little while piano. I was in the drama club. I did visual arts. I loved to paint. I loved to draw. I've been involved in semi-professional dance troops. Everybody said, well, you, you have the personality of an artist. You're not going to succeed in science. And nobody seemed to want to listen to the fact that I wanted to do science. 
And I wanted to bring all that art and all that drama and all that dance and all that music with me. But the stuff I could not get out of my head, I just couldn't get out of my damn head, was Jupiter and the sun and how the galaxy worked. So why did we think that these things were so polar opposite? And we tell kids that and we say, you're a, the right personality to be an artist or a scientist. And it, it's so harmful and it's so untrue. Okay, so what is our responsibility to society? I want some aspect of science to inspire everybody. You sort of go around the world and you meet your tribe. There are people that are interested in astronomy and they just love it. They, they can't even tell you why. And those people go across every boundary humans have ever put up, whether it's skin tone or hair texture or you know, what we call gender or economics, uh, geography. I want to bring everybody along. I want to make it relevant to them aesthetically and artistically and, and maybe in what they call spiritually. I want people to benefit from our knowledge and the inspiration that we have. Of course, I want people to take things like climate change more seriously, and I want people to have successful medical treatments, but I want the spirit enriched, the spirit of humanity. You were talking about impact and about having a career, and how do you know what the impact of that career will be? And it's probably no surprise for you to hear that when a little kid says they want to be an astrophysicist, the first thing their parents think is, how the hell are you going to pay for that? And you'll never get a job. I've been told so many times in my career by professors, by well-meaning counselors, by friends, just give up. There's no way you're going to get a job. There's no way you're going to fit in. There's no way you're ever going to be successful at this. And I may not be doing exactly what I thought I would be doing. I may not be the top of my field, but I have found a place. I mean, in this case, it was something I was doing for myself. You don't get rich being an astrophysicist. But this was something I was doing for me. And whether you're going to be a lawyer or an artist or a doctor, before you think about what the impact will be, it has to have the foundation of something you would do just by yourself without any external approval, just something you have to do. And then you start from that core that this is this important to me. And people actually start to respond to that. That aids you then to find your place in the actual profession. Right. And so what I'm hearing is that it is important to first and foremost, follow your own curiosity, because if you don't follow your curiosity, there is no amount of external validation that is really going to ever replace that fire in your heart. But that being said, when I look at the generational gap between us and so the, you know, the generations from the 50s, 60s, 70s, that era, there was a lot of hope for the future, which meant that you had the time and the space to explore your creativity and to find out what it is that you really wanted to do. But when I think a young person growing up today is looking towards the future, there is a lot of fear, right? There's this sense that the future has been stolen away from them, whether you look at climate change or politics or inequality. I mean, the generation that's coming up right now has sort of been screwed over and there's this real sense of not having the time or the space to find out who we are and what we want to become. So in these times in particular, when it feels like time is running out, how do you recommend that young people especially balance the pursuit of their own curiosity and the responsibility that they have towards the world to, well, I guess, create a world that they want to live in? Oh, yeah. I wish I had a wonderful, happy answer to that. In order to, for example, combat climate change, we are going to need scientists. We are going to need engineers. We are going to need doctors. We are going to need biologists. We are going to need transportation experts. We are going to need economists. We are going to need lawyers. The thing about being a NASA scientist, a government scientist, and I believe this is appropriate, I am not allowed to advocate for a specific policy. So policy is up to the government and the public. So it's not appropriate for me to go somewhere and say, we shouldn't have more new coal plants or everybody should be solar energy. But what I can do is that there is no boundary when it comes to scientific fact. There's no restriction. So I often do these little lunch on the hills, congressional staffer lunches in the buildings in Washington. And I will show them exactly how fast the ocean level is rising. And I will show them our measurements of the ice cap. And I will say the projections are a meter, at least a meter. The worst case scenario is getting close to eight feet now. That is absolutely protected. And so I spend much more time talking about earth science and climate science. 
every single human on the planet is going to be affected by this. And we all have our role to play. But that doesn't mean that there'll be no role for artists. I mean, artists have to communicate this and give people hope. And architects need to adapt for different weather conditions and different materials and different energy needs. So yes, you can still be an astronomer. You may end up doing some work that is perhaps not exactly your specialty, or at least the institution you work for may direct more of its resources to earth science. I still think there's a use for the inspiration and the knowledge as well, but I'm very disheartened by people thinking that this cannot be solved because I get a number of different ways people go with this. People seem to say, when's the cutoff? How long do we have in order for this to not affect us this badly? Long gone. (laughs) Done. The meter ocean level rise is going to happen. That's not controversial. The worst case scenarios are significantly worse than that. The wide scale disruption of human occupation and agriculture and governments will happen. And it will happen if not in your children's lifetime, then in your grandchildren's lifetime. But the idea that we can't protect and move a billion people in 80 years, the idea that we can't go to a very, very low carbon output as a species, the visionaries would laugh at us because we already have the technology, we already have the global wealth that isn't distributed enough to do this, but we can adjust. We can start moving agriculture to where it will be more tenable in 80 years. The wine growers of California are already doing this. They're all moving up into Oregon and Canada, and they're planting vines that will be ready to harvest in 50 years because you need a good vine. We can move people away from the low-lying areas, and yes, that means relocating most of Bangladesh, and we're going to have to figure out how to do that. That's something that I do not have the solution to, but I mean, all I can say is, yes, the kids are right. They're in for a hard time. I'm sorry about that. Oh, wow. Um, That's super sobering. When I think of the popular climate narrative, it's that we still have time, maybe just barely to avert disaster. But what I'm hearing you say is that, well, disaster is sort of inevitable, guys. It's too late already. So let's just try to prepare for it and mitigate further damage. And I think that message just strikes home a little stronger and feels less partisan. So something I'm going to have to noodle about. Um, But going back to the original question, I think it really sounds like you're advocating for people to pursue their curiosity first and foremost, because without that curiosity, people aren't going to be motivated to make any great discoveries anyways. You need to have fuel in the engine. So I thought that was really, really interesting. We need creativity big time to solve these problems. And even the process of art and music And I would argue science affects your brain and how you can think of many different solutions, and integrate many different ways of thinking. That would turn out to be a survival trait that humanity needs right now. Yeah, I agree with you. We totally have the technology, right? What we just are missing is the willpower to bring the change forward. And when we speak of capitalism within the arts, I think that science falls under a similar category. It's like, okay, we need more art that will move the hearts and minds of people to get us from where we are right now to where we need to be. And we need to figure out how to close that gap as soon as possible because we're running out of time. However, when we look at the way that money flows in the world, the arts are being used as entertainment and marketing, and that's the primary use case for them. And if you're unable to create the job market for this kind of creativity to thrive, and you don't create the kind of heroes and the narratives that we need in order to survive, then you're never going to have these career paths that are critical to ensure that we solve the world's biggest problems. When I was doing some research prior to this podcast, I noticed that NASA and the Jet Propulsion Laboratory does collaborations with artists and where they bring sort of these interdisciplinary collaborations together. I was wondering what kind of collaboration criteria do you guys have when working with artists in order to make sure that the messages get out there? What kind of qualifications or attributes do they have to meet? Well, I think one of the lessons you learn is to work with other institutions because at NASA, by and large, a scientist or an engineer can't really make that judgment. I remember that one thing that we did, JPL has a a wonderful artist. His name is Dan Goods, and his actual title there is visual strategist. And of course, NASA hires an army of graphic artists and animators, people who are able to take scientific data and make like a beautiful map of the sun's magnetic field, or they're able to design an excellent web presence, all of that. So we have have sort of those practical side of science, of art that goes on. But Dan is actually a conceptual artist. 
he's not a graphic artist. And he was doing these large scale installations to try to bring a very different audience. One of them was in a, a botanical garden. It was in the shape of a seashell that you walked into the spiral. He'd made it all out of rattan twigs. And in the middle, he had all these little auditory sensors all over the inside where you would actually be able to hear in real time with real data where the different satellites were above the Earth. And uh, satellites, if you've ever seen one in the sky, they go pretty quickly across the sky. They orbit around the entire Earth every 90 minutes, those in low Earth orbit. And so you would sit and you would hear over the course of minutes little different pings and tones and bell tones as different satellites came over. And you became aware of the fact that you were in this larger environment of science. That is something that is harder to get funding for. There's a difference in opinion in the government as to whether that's worth funding. I obviously think it's worth funding to have art without a specific goal. We have artists that are going to show you the best images of Jupiter and, and make wonderful diagrams of the interior. And then we work with other institutions to, to, to help us choose as many ways you can partner with people and use their expertise and make them part of this whole process. I, I think that for me, successful in this case, and then this is an, an evaluation criteria you can't put numbers on, is that we actually managed to work with a very, very different audience. And we attracted people to a scientific theme in a, in a very different way. They weren't coming to learn a fact about science. They were sort of trying to see what the scientists had experienced and what they might be trying to say. And that will mean so many different things to so many different people. And I, I thought that was a victory that we, we were able to make that jump. So because I'm sure all of you here are really curious about what this art installation sounds like, I went online to search for it, and it's called The Orbit Pavilion. The sounds are made by a gentleman called Shane Murbach, and they have an entire audio track on SoundCloud that is available. I thought I'd put just 30 seconds here for you guys to get a sense of what it sounds like, but head over, Google it, check it out. It's kind of amazing. All right, guys, welcome back to Earth. That was 30 seconds, but there are 10 more minutes of this if you're curious to listen to the entire track. I hope you take the time to check it out. But back to the conversation with Michelle Thaler, I was just telling her how amazing it would be if a grant existed for scientists and artists alike to pursue the boundaries of their creativity, wondering what kind of amazing achievements could be accomplished. And this is the story she had to tell us. Think about all of the people now that are working in particle physics and theoretical physics and what happened before the Big Bang. There is something worthwhile in the human endeavor to explore these boundaries. And I know right now that seems completely impractical, but I once had uh, dinner when I was a graduate student with a, with a wonderful old man named Charlie Towns. And Charlie Towns was one of the inventors of the laser. He was just a physicist, seeing if he could get light waves to kind of all line up in one certain way. And he said, well, this is great, but they'll never be practical. He said that when they made the laser, how many lasers do you have in your house right now? When they made the laser, they didn't think there was a practical use for it. We just don't know. I mean, we're experimenting at the boundaries of physics and the boundaries of astronomy, the way the universe was billions of years ago. Just today, the paper was published today, we found a giant black hole more than a billion times the mass of the sun, which in itself is cool, but this one is so far away that the universe was less than a billion years old. It was only about 700 million years old. We don't know how such a big black hole could form in that short of a time since the Big Bang. And these wonders are falling out of the sky. We don't know if there'll ever be anything practical, but I think there is a real use to learning art and learning music, even if you're never going to be a professional practitioner of that, even if you're not particularly talented at that. There is a similar enrichment to learning science. And whether that just means watching a television show or going to a website or going to a museum or going to a movie or you know, reading a NASA press release, the enrichment of doing something different than your everyday life will allow us the creativity and the strength and the integrity to tackle some of these huge problems coming up. Not gonna lie, I just looked around my house to count the number of lasers I have lying around. And so I counted my phone, my mouse and remote controls, just to name a few. And I had no idea that it was initially discovered as an accident. So thank you for sharing that. When it comes to the importance of the arts, I think that 
the real struggle really comes to the fact that, you know, at least with the sciences, you can license a piece of technology. So somebody somewhere can ultimately make money off of it. Whereas with the arts, I think it's a little bit different, right? Cultural investments tend to fall under categories like philanthropy or government. And it sort of eventually erodes because it can't self-sustain itself. And unless you tie it into something capitalistic like entertainment or gentrification, it sort of falls onto the wayside. And so although we can never quite figure out how to measure the value of art in its entirety, I am so curious about how we may better measure the impact of art so that we can better sell the impact of art so that maybe one day more people can start investing in the impact of art. I'd just be really curious to know if you have any ideas or thoughts or perspectives on that specific piece. Well, for one thing, I think we've been told a big lie about the scarcity of money. We mentioned the Science Mission Directorate, where we have close to 110 active missions, and these are huge things. I mean, the Hubble Space Telescope is the size of a freight car. Our entire operating budget yearly is a little bit more than $5 billion. Now, $5 billion to operate 110 science missions, all of the Earth science satellites, everything that's monitoring pollution and ozone and hurricanes and sea level rise, and exploring the planets and monitoring the sun for solar storms, $5 billion is nothing. I mean, I understand it sounds like a large amount of money. The thing that's been frustrating for me, and, and here I just speak personally, this is not anything to do with my affiliation or my employment. In our culture, it just seems to me like there's so much money being creamed off by you know very, very wealthy corporations and people. In the government, you know, when you look at something like military spending, a lot of times people think that NASA has the equivalent of a military budget. $5 billion a year? I think it was actually proven that a couple of years ago, the military spent more on air conditioning. It's a lie. It's a lie that we don't have the cultural resources to robustly support science and the arts and to deal with poverty and to deal with hunger. We're being fed this, this cultural lie. And I think that when it comes to change, like I said, you people say, you know, what do you do about climate change? It's like, is it cloth bags or plastic bags? No, sorry. It means changing the government. And the thing about what can you do is you have to start at local levels. Your state Congress, your local mayor, people that are in your community make a huge difference. Local mayors can help things like with voter suppression, right? They can really keep an eye on whether people are having a fair chance to vote. All the way up to setting congressional boundaries, we need to work together to change this huge cultural lie that's going on. And so, I mean, I just completely throw it back that there isn't funding, and that something needs to be completely practical. The soul of humanity is based on, like music, art, science. You're not going to get me saying the best argument for these things is the technological spinoffs. I don't agree. The technological spinoffs are wonderful. But what I want is the lack of lie that we can't support a thriving culture, and that this can't be somehow outputted to the rest of the world. I'm sorry. I don't see any practical way to do that. I don't see, like you said, I don't see the will to do that. So what do you think we can do to increase the willpower of people? I think we're asking the wrong questions. Act local. Start there. This is not going to be solved by whether you recycle individually. It's not. Instead, work on changing the government. Work on changing the divisions. A friend of mine here in the sort of more liberal Maryland area, they've struck up multi-year relationships with some of the more rural and poor counties in Virginia that they would like to change the politics of. Don't just point your finger and say how stupid somebody is. Try to understand where they're coming from. We've all been taught to judge people subconsciously. And when you're raised from a child, knowing you react to this type of person differently from that type of person, you have to understand that you need to own your own. As a woman, I need to own my own misogyny. As a white person, I need to own my white supremacy. I am not a terrible person, and I'm trying to change these assumptions. But you have got to start there and own it. You talked about being an advocate. so. I can advocate differently than you because I know more about the science and the results and the statistics and the earth science and all of that. And I can go to, to Congress and to the staff for lunches and I can tell them all about it. And maybe I'm not very good at organizing protests. When I think about how do I put together a protest or a march, that fills me with terror. Maybe somebody else is a really good organizer. Artists have their own ways of advocating. And even if you don't spend all of your time advocating, what a horrible thing that people of privilege would just sit back and go, oh, I have privilege. I can't do anything. I'll just hide here and just let the world go to hell because I have privilege. 
take the privilege and do something with it and bring others up and learn to strike that privilege down or at least even it out, but use what you have. I'd like the privileged people of this world to start taking this up a lot more than they have. Absolutely. This seems to be a recurrent theme in the podcast is just everyone saying how important it is to not only look externally at all the problems that need to be solved, but to also pay attention internally at all the things that we can solve ourselves, both within how we see the world, but how our small little actions can really add up. What do you think is the biggest divide right now? Like what is the biggest thing that we need to overcome right here if we were to make it through the next 80 years to move a billion people. I really am somewhat amazed by just how easy it seems to get people riled up in hate and all of this. I don't have a solution for this. I am from a very politically conservative town, a small town in Waukesha, and the people I grew up with were absolutely wonderful people. I don't agree with them about a lot of things, but we have so much more in common than we have different. When you actually look at who we are as humans and what our experience of being a human is, it overlaps almost entirely. There's a little bit on the outside that's different. <laughs> yeah. You know, atheist scientist, Jesuit, uh, Vatican. But right now, our leaders really do seem to be trying to separate us deliberately. And that to me is so sad. It became politically expedient not to compromise. If I see people online in the television that are advocating something that I think is horrible, they're doing something that I really disagree with, I have far more in common with them than we have differences. Please, can we all just dial it down and start being more gentle and more respectful of each other? And then we can talk about why we have these different opinions. I hope that starts to happen somehow. I thought social yeah. media would be a platform for that. I didn't think it would go this far the other way. Yeah, well, humans aren't really evolving at the same pace as technology and technology, especially social media, was really just not designed with our best interests at heart. You know, it was designed with the interest of maximizing profits. And so the unintended consequences of social media, unfortunately, have been like just slamming into our democracy right now. So I think that this is a problem that's going to probably repeat itself in many different ways, because when you live in a system that is driven by capitalism, it doesn't have humanity's best interests at heart. All right, this is a super depressing arc. There is one more question I want to ask you, though. It's how do you define impact? Like, what does impact mean to you? We've talked about the fact that we have tried to evaluate impact in many formal ways. We've had people do research. We've had people do studies. We've had people track numbers of social media hits and all of that. Um, I, I feel dissatisfied by this. You know, doing something only for guaranteed impact when this is something you can't measure. I remember working with people at NASA headquarters, and they were very well-meaning in this. But they said that if we can't actually demonstrate an upswing in American student science scores, we have to actually move the needle. If this couple-year campaign doesn't actually show better science scores, then it hasn't been a successful campaign. It hasn't had the impact that we want. There are so many other factors to students' scores. Parenting, poverty, uh, large-scale policy, individuals, whatever. Don't ask for something that you, you're not going to get an answer that's real. I mean, one of the wonderful clarities of being a scientist is there's lots of things we would love to know. But you have to design an experiment to measure something you can actually know, <laughs> that you can measure. <laughs> I was working with some teachers, and we were giving them some time on our space telescopes to actually do their own observations. And one of them said, you know, I would love to observe two black holes colliding. And we said, yes, you and everybody else, and we've never actually seen it. <laughs> I mean, yes, you'd love to see that, but you're not going to see it. So how about we pick a question, and we start there, that we have some hope of answering. How about we pick some change that we have some hope of making? It's sort of like a lot of kids will say, how can I become an astronaut? And the truth of the matter is that pretty much everybody who's an astronaut succeeded in a field before they applied to the astronaut corps. They were excellent scientists or engineers or pilots or medical doctors. So those are sort of some of the typical ones. And then at least a little bit later in life, they said, you know, I'd like to be an astronaut, but that you don't become an astronaut just by itself. You first are something else. And there's a lot of people that seem to think, well, if I can't be immediately famous or successful or rich, I haven't done something right. And the whole idea is do what you can and what you are good at and what you love. Do that first and then look for what the next step is. 
it's odd to think that I've become a very recognizable scientist. Before COVID, if I were out just walking around the streets, it usually would happen at least every couple of days that a stranger would stop me. When you're on the New York subway and a stranger, somebody actually was delivering like food in one of those padded bags, says Michelle Fowler. And it's like, Somebody just called my both my first and last names and we talked astronomy. That would happen to me every couple of days. And people say, well, how can I get to be that? I never thought this was going to happen. I mean, astronomy was something that I couldn't get a job in and I wasn't the right personality and kind of a professional failure because I don't have as many publications as other people do. And there's no answer to how you get here. You have to live for yourself. You really do. If you're just doing it to get famous or rich, you may still get famous or rich, but people, I think, respond to integrity. We're that good at psychology, at knowing each other. Start with yourself. Start with that change first. It's absolutely beautiful, and I couldn't agree more. If you were to start with changing ourselves, then what do you think is the singular most important attribute that we all should be striving to cultivate? I think the most underrated human virtue is curiosity. I think it's very difficult to actually hate someone if you can be curious about why they feel that way. Or it's very difficult to be afraid of something if you're curious about how it works. It's sort of this famous poem, you know, the epitaph of the astronomer. But we love the night sky so deeply that we couldn't be afraid of the night. And I think that the invitation I have is just be curious about something. People say, how do I find what I'm supposed to do? What is my path? What is something that you honestly are curious about? Right now, I'm making a giant Halloween village in my basement. You know, there's the stupid little villages with all the little things that go around, all the little figures. I, I freaking wanted one. You know, I, I mean, find something that you can hold on to and see. I'm curious about how you do this modeling. I'm curious about how you begin to create this. I'm curious about how you do watercolors. I'm curious about what happens inside the sun. I'm curious about what happens inside my heart with the blood. As an astronomer, I hope that someday you'll want to know about Jupiter and someday you'll want to know about the Big Bang. Just start with being curious. You've done such a wonderful thing, just that one step to enrich yourself. And with your self-respect and your own integrity and your own self-love, you can start to change others as well. Be curious. All right. Noted on my list of things to do. And I just want to say that I particularly love that line about saying how hard it is to hate someone if you're curious about why they feel that way in the first place. I'm going to have to keep that one in mind when I get upset browsing social media. All right. Thank you for your time, Michelle. I guess everyone can just find you by Googling Michelle Thaller. Oh, yeah. So I, I mean, I used to have all kinds of public social media and then I did the usual thing of shutting it all down. I apologize for that. I did not have the time to deal with the pressure. I don't have people to answer my mail. And so I would get hundreds of emails. I couldn't answer them. People would get angry, you know, a thousand people a day. It got to be too much. So I am a little bit hard to find for one-on-one -on -one interaction. And I apologize. I'm sorry if I'm not as easy to find personally. I wish everybody out there so much, so much love. And I mean that. All right, guys, that was Michelle Thaller. That's T-H-A-L-L-E-R. You can find her just on Google where there are tons of talks that she has given that are absolutely fascinating. I'm curious to know what your takeaways are from this week's episodes. So if you have any thoughts, comments, or criticisms, feel free to send them to us at Impact Everywhere Podcast on Instagram, where we also share favorite quotes, audiograms, and graphics from every episode. Next week, we feature 18-year-old youth activist and spoken word poet Royce Mann, who went mega viral when he was just 14 years old, getting himself on every single major news network in the world. For those of you who are curious and want a sneak peek, Google white boy privilege and it'll blow your mind away. In the meantime, I hope you all stay safe, positive and empowered because impact is everywhere. <laughs>